Hello, my name is Andrew Collins and I'm a telly addict. What's your definition of a Sunday night drama? For me, it's a drama they show on Sunday nights. And a major new series for Sunday nights now on BBC One. One big push for me. First floor for menswear, luggage and hairdressing. Where are we going, Mother? Why must we go so early? We're going to go and meet the King. I mean, if I shouted blue murder every time someone tried to kiss me at Eton, I'd have gone hoarse in a month. But with the blockbusting success of blockbusters like Midwife, Selfridge, Queen, Downton and Endeavour variously pulling in between 5 and 10 million people who don't want to think about going back to work on Monday, it seems to me that broadcasters are now scheduling Sunday night dramas all week. Who? Ellie. Girlfriend. She's not my girlfriend. Gillian's coming. Gillian? Yes! Oh, and Kate's moving in. What was last tango in Halifax if not a classic Sunday night drama on Tuesday night? Bed, dearest, now. Why, Mummy? School tomorrow, for starters, and for seconds, some things are for grown-ups. And what was Breathless, if not a classic Sunday night drama, on a Thursday night? As for Death in Paradise, newly returned for its third series to Tuesday nights on BBC One, why it isn't up against a marple or a poirot after a day of gardening and supplements, I haven't a clue. What are they all doing here? This is the part where you expose the killer. In front of everyone? It's how Richard did it. Ah, yes, for anyone not up to speed with this enormously likeable, preternaturally gentle cop out of water show, that's BT's Chris Marshall as a bumbling English detective who's been sent to a made up Caribbean island to solve murders. His first being that of. Bridget! <laughs> ben Miller, the bumbling English detective who was previously sent to the made up Caribbean island. Now, here's where I confess that I never watched it with Ben Miller in it, not because of him, but because I feared the whole program might be too gentle, even for me. So just as this was gently turning into this, I barged in shouting, hello, right, get me up to speed. I did the same with Silent Witness, finally tuning in just as Amanda Burton was leaving at the start of series eight. Your new inspector. speak highly of Ben Miller, but I have to say I warmed to Marshall straight away and wondered why I'd resisted the age-old Englishman Abroad set up for two successful series. London speaks very highly of it. Nice, slightly macabre touch too to have the incoming bumbler investigate the murder of the outgoing bumbler. The pace of life and police work on the island is cartoonishly languid and to make the colonial visitor look especially uptight, all the black characters are super cool. But they're not the forensically challenged yokels some reviewers have made them out to be. Um, sir, hmm? preliminary autopsy results. was not it? Respiratory failure from 8 milligrams of tetrodotoxin. That's puffer fish poison. Puffer fish? Yes. Defects take a while to kick in. Red Dwarf's winning Danny John Jules there, and French Portuguese actress Sarah Martin as the will they won't they know they won't love interest. Gosh, that takes some beating. What does? You're so beautiful. It is so beautiful, not you, you're not, God no. <laughs> Death in Paradise proved an unexpected pleasure for me, and unlike die-hard fans, I'm finding it remarkably easy to get used to the new guy. I'm partial to a murder mystery anyway, and if they can wrap one up and get to the veranda for a beer in one hour, all the better. Here's a new drama that is on a Sunday night, BBC One's latest historically promiscuous costume romp, The Musketeers. Wait a minute, where have we seen these credits before? Oh dear, that didn't end well. Let's hope The Musketeers has more luck than Ripper Street in pulling a large mainstream audience. By which I mean let's hope BBC One don't move it from Sundays to a less amenable slot on Mondays for its second series, thus reducing its chances of survival to those of a blameless Victorian prostitute. Anyway, The Musketeers did what it said on the side of the Alexandre Dumas book. <laughs> Us. For God's sake, pull up your sword. You'll have to kill me for it. Three large hatted 17th century French cavalrymen and a plus one eschew the weaponry of their job description and selflessly fence their way around Paris, doing the right thing when not being led by their swords by attractive young women in push up bodices. Stabbed in combat at the siege of Montauban, 21. And this one? Musket ball at the Ile de Ré, 22. 
The one named after an aftershave and played by the Venezuelan-born Chilean-British heartthrob Santiago Cabrera will be when Cardinal Richelieu gets home and finds him in the bedchamber with his mistress, played by the village's Emily Beecham. You burn in hell! I have worked to here first. Timely and untimely casting of Peter Capaldi as the moustache twirling leather clad baddie, as he's likely to be busy on a certain Saturday tea time favourite come the second series. But I strongly advise an inquiry. Talking of tea time, there are hints at sex and malevolent cruelty, and there are obviously quite a lot of flashing blades, but there's nothing in the Musketeers to justify its post watershed slot. Creator Adrian Hodges even does that anachronistic modern dialogue thing for the kids who dig Merlin or Atlantis. This looks like a badger's intestines. Speciality of the house. Enjoy. What's your problem, boy? I rather enjoyed it for what it was, although interesting casting helped. I particularly liked personal favourite Tom Burke as Athos, who, when he's not inconsistently assessing disability claimants, no, sorry, that's Athos, is a bit of a slob and has a very effective looking 17th century hangover cure. Remind you of anyone currently on BBC Three? I miss you, Gwen. I can't go on without you. Still really enjoying Nick Helm in Uncle, by the way, but back to the safety of Sunday night, where, incidentally, the Musketeers fenced off 7.5 million for its first episode. Not such good news for... With the unenviable task of delivering comparable numbers to BBC One's amniotic tidal wave called The Midwife, ITV's Mr Selfridge returned last weekend, two million down on last year's premiere. And with this year's sexiest war looming too. Archduke Is she coming? Ah, uh, she said, don't wait for her. Archduke Let's get ourselves home. I never said subtly looming. Hey, Andrew Davis' swirling Edwardian department store saga was a special offer it was difficult to refuse last year, not least because of Jeremy Piven's statuesque central performance. He's back, the old philanderer, minus his family, so shop girl made good Miss Towler, played with appealing reticence by Ashling Loftus, and indeed the whole cast about you being served. Five years on, the new series began with reassuring tracking shot bustle. Not long now, Miss Hawkins, you'll be needed upstairs. No, no, no. Over there, please. Yes, I'm just on my way. Director Anthony Byrne, who has upstairs downstairs on a strong CV and so moves fetlock tugging staff around with aplomb, is among many Series 1 veterans, ensuring continuity. But one melancholy storyline, that of the won't they, won't they romance between Tom Goodman Hill's head of HR and Amanda Abington's head of accessories, has curdled further over five years. Are you quite well? Oh, you know, family life. Three children under the age of five. Four nights sleep are just a memory. May I know the reason for your requested leave? Uh, my brother is dying in Geneva. I'd more than happily watch an entire series of these two tiptoeing around each other as if trapped in a perpetual brief encounter. Although elsewhere, the appearance of Lord Loxley has spiced things up a bit. So, this is Selfridges. Thought I'd come and see where my wife spends all her time. <laughs> And money. Why don't you both join us for lunch? I'm here for business, not pleasure. You better know I'm closing our account here with immediate effect. You knew he was going to be a bad un. The last time we saw that tasty actor, Aidan McArdle, on a Sunday night, Poirot murdered him. Actually, that was on a Wednesday night. What was the final Poirot doing on a Wednesday night? You see how confusing all this is? There aren't enough nights in the week to contain all this glut of gentle drama. This sort of thing would have happened at Harrods. In brief, I too am the sort of person who actually cheers when I hear this. Warning, this program contains scenes of strong violence and horror. But you can get those just looking out of the window. Which is why I'm not immune to the tension relieving shoulder rub of a Sunday night drama, which, like an all day breakfast, is now an all week proposition. And relax. Come on then. Plenty of room. Oh! A quick recommendation to anyone who thinks they've seen all the BBC4 music documentaries they need to see for the three-part Born to be Wild, the Golden Age of American Rock, which is on iPlayer until Friday. Here's Ted Nugent. The dopers couldn't tune their instruments, the dopers couldn't remember an arrangement, and the dopers had no soul to care about an efficient professional delivery of their craft, service or wares. 
Case fucking closed. I hate hippies. Hardly a moment of zen, but for that, we have Russell Brand's girlfriend, Jemima Calm's lovely dog, Brian. He's an Alsatian, he's come out white. What's it? He's, a, he's a lovely, beautiful dog, and he's representative of very pure principles, but the, sh the sad thing is he does look like the logo of a far-right party. <laughs> <laughs> like a symbol of Nazism, yeah, but with yeah. a heart of gold. <laughs>